this is Misha Houston and I'm here to do my review for the haves and the have nots. Tonight's episode is entitled Railroad and it kind of felt like a filler filler episode but it's, it still had some very good confrontations and I do sense a little bit more of story movement. So thank you Tyler Perry for just for that and I did very much enjoy the episode even though it did feel a little bit like a filler episode. The first group of people we go to is Charles, Candace, the Secret Service, Land and Landon. Now Candace has no idea of what is going on. The Secret Service agent is on the computer looking at pictures of Charles and and his children and he thinks that Candace has been stalking him for five years. She says those pictures aren't hers but the Secret Service doesn't believe her at all. She looks to Charles for help but he could care less. She asks him why are you doing this and then he asks her in return did you record me? She admits that she did, but only that one piece that she played for him. The piece, excuse me, he asks, does that make it right? And she says, no, it doesn't. Candace apologizes for what she did. He asks her, are we clear on how this goes? She says, yes. He says, I can play this game much better than you can. She says she wasn't trying to play him. The, the Secret Service then asked Charles, what do you want to be done with her? Charles says, what happened? He, then he mentions another girl that tried to do this to him. And he says that she got life in Guantanamo Bay, which is on the outskirts of Cuba. Candace begs him, and Charles has her handcuffed. He tells her that he knows there's nothing, she knows that you really don't have anything on him. No phones, no backups, and no, any, and no kind of recordings. He knows about Oscar at the bar as well, and she only recorded him once. And the conversation that, they, that she did record was deleted. He asks her, why, why didn't you try to go after me? And she tells him that she thinks that he's a very handsome man and a great father and that he got her all excited. She asks, yeah, she asks that she, she, well, rather she tells him that she just wanted him to come back to her, that he, that she really liked him and that he just want, she just wanted him to come back and not to just disappear from her life. The, the secret, he, then he orders the Secret Service to uncuff Candace and he asks them to leave the room. After they leave, they, they take her phone, they take her phones and everything that she pretty much had with her, any kind of electronic devices that she had with her, you know, despite her objections. Candace says, we, can we start over? And he says, yes, we can. Then he introduces himself as Charles Fredrickson, a senator and the future president of the United States. She says that her name is Candace. And then he says, no, your name is over your head. You, you tried this with the wrong person. Then he asks her, have you ever done this before? And then he warns her not to lie to him. He says, don't lie. Whatever you do, don't lie. She admits that she's done this a few times. Then he asks about, is that how you got over $7 million? And she realizes that she cannot lie to, to lie to him because he practically knows everything about her. He tells her that this is not the first person to try this. Candace says that she should have known better. 
she asked, would you have sent me to prison? And he says, quicker than you can say Guantanamo. Candace is shocked, and she thought that he was a good and decent person, but she just realizes that he's nothing but a con man. That he's nothing but a con man that managed to get a, a few people to vote for him. He says he is nice, but he's also this other person named Chucky, and he's a real MF. He's a, you know, I'm trying not to curse as much, so. Um, he says that he's a real MF. Then he tries to strong arm her and to continue to, into sleeping with her, and pretty much wants, him, wants her to be one of his, I guess, one of his prostitutes when he comes into town. She immediately says no. And then he says that he was hoping that, you know, he could be one of his sexual stops and she says no. And she says, if, you, if I can't be your number one, then there's no number two for me. He then goes into her life story. You know, her time as an escort in college, her time as a blackmailer, and that she's wanted in a for questioning in in a murder he says that he, she is nothing but a power powder keg ready to explode she asks how how long have you known who i was and he he says he says as soon as she sat down from the table he saw her at the hotel and he wanted to know who she was he also knows about oscar too and that he was hired by some people to take him down. She asked, if you knew who I were, why did you go along with this? Why did you come here to my room? And he says, because I think you're one of the sexiest women that he's ever known. She, she also says that if you know me so well, then you know that I'm just a mess and I'm not to be trusted. And then Charles says, as long as I have the reins, as long as I can sit in the power chair, and as long as I have the upper hand, uh, then he can trust her and that he can deal with her. Then all of a sudden Landon comes into the room. And Landon is visibly shocked to see Candace there in her bathrobe and in his bed. He tries to usher him out of town, but he says that, I mean, yeah, he tries to usher him out of town because he says there was a shooting not far from where he was slated to speak. Charles is expected to give a speech and to talk to the child's grandmother. He refuses to do it because he doesn't want to prey on anyone's grief, but Landon says that it will help his standing. He says that he's the best in his business and he was trained by Maggie Day. Charles says that he will consider it. Now Landon, you know, tries to get him out of the room and tries to get him away from Candace, but he eventually orders Landon out of the room. After Landon leaves, he asks Candace, will you be here tonight? And she agrees to it. And, and then that old snake Charles just slithers out of the room and closes the door. Yeah, I mean, Charles is nothing but a snake. He's nothing but a con man that has fooled people into believing that he's able to, you know, be one of the most powerful men in the world. I mean, I just, I, I like him less and less. I mean, at first, I didn't think anything of him, and now that he has more screen time, I like him less and less. The next group of people we go to is Veronica and Melissa. Now, another snake comes slithering into Melissa's hospital room, and then Melissa sits up. Melissa compliments Veronica on her outfit and Veronica says then I just I'm gonna I'm gonna have to go home and change Veronica says you gave her a scare 
Veronica forces her to apologize for scaring her, and Melissa does. Veronica says, you put my grandchild in great danger. She says she knows, she knows Melissa didn't really mean to. Melissa says that it's, says that, that she's sorry for it. And then she asks her, is that all you care about? But then Veronica says, what else? What else should I care about? Melissa says, me. And then Veronica tells her, I don't, I don't really care about you at all. All I care about is the legacy that I leave behind. And then Melissa says, okay. Veronica asks her, do you, do you really want to die? And Melissa says, yes. And then Veronica asks her, why? Melissa answers, because her father died. And then Veronica coldly says, people die. That's what happens. Melissa tells, tells Veronica that I just want to go with my father. Then Veronica slaps her, just slaps her out of the blue and says, you, you want to die? You want, no, excuse me, you don't want to die. You just want to live. You want to live well and you want to have money and you want to be a good mother to the baby. Melissa screams at her saying, don't touch me again. And then Veronica slaps her again. Melissa screams at her to stop it. Then, then, then Veronica orders her to shut, shut her mouth. Veronica says, you, says you, you want to die? You are just, you, excuse me. She says, you don't want to die. You just being dramatic and all you want is some attention. You, and then you also want something that I can't give which is sympathy, which is true because she has no sympathy for anyone or anything. She says that life is hard and that shit happens and it's just another Negro that's died and you need to move on with your life. If you wanted to die, you would have buried that blade deeper into your wrist. She says that she ought to slap her again for ruining her sheets. You know, so cold and ugly and so, such a horrible person. Veronica says that she has to go to court in the morning and that you ruined her beauty sleep. She, but instead that she was here with, with her, you know, in this hospital. Veronica threatens Melissa by saying that the only thing that's keeping you alive is the baby. She says if you want to take care, that you need to take care of that baby. And if you do take care of the baby, I'll make sure that I'll take care of you. I'll make sure that you eat and you can even have the crumbs off your baby's table. Ugh, so awful. But if you don't take care of the baby, Death won't be a problem. She says, if you try to kill yourself again, I'll make sure that you survive in a catatonic state. Well, you'll be, you'll be fully alive, but you won't be able to move or speak or control what happens to you. She says, I'll show you what hell is really like. I'll let you be living, but dead. Then Veronica threatens her again, saying that if you try to do anything like this again, I'll throw you off of a roof, and then I'll revive you so you can live in some sort of catatonic state. She then kisses Melissa on the forehead, and she slithers out of the room like the snake that she is. Now, I want to talk about Veronica for a minute. She says that she's all about her legacy. But what kind of legacy do you have when your husband has, that once loved you has now left you? What kind of legacy do you have when your son despises you? What kind of legacy do you have when you're millions of dollars in debt? What kind of legacy do you have when you don't have any kind of any friends or anyone to love you? I mean, 
she has her businesses but we all know that she's in debt she has no friends no family no one loves her or cares for her and she's whining on to melissa about a legacy she's got a lot of work to do and she's pinning a little bit too much on the baby a baby can only get you so far a grandson can only get you so far and I really think that she's crazy and delusional and she really proved how delusional she was when she started in on Melissa she's she's really a sad person and I, I, I don't know whether I hate her or just pity her she's really a pathetic evil person and I think I'll, I'll just move on to the next section the next group we go to is Hannah Catherine the funeral director and Mitch Hannah and Catherine are looking over caskets with the funeral director Hannah is concerned about how she's going to pay for this but Catherine says that she'll cover the cost the, the funeral director says they can pick up Quincy's body today and ask Hannah when do they want to do the funeral and Hannah says, I want to have it on Saturday. The funeral uh, director says that's, that's plenty of time. And he, sa he also says that he knows how hard this is for her and that she is in his prayers. As Catherine escorts him out, Hannah picks up her phone to call Benny. You know, she wants Benny here with her, you know, when it comes to Quincy and the funeral. Mitch answers the phone. She asks where is Benny multiple times and he tells her that Benny is away from the phone or he's at the store or you know he's off doing something. She can tell that he's lying and afraid he went after Warlock but Mitch tells her that that's not true. He never went after Warlock. She asks him once again but Mitch won't answer. Then Catherine takes the phone and, you know, you know, she takes the phone to talk to Mitch. Mitch tells her that Benny is at the police station and that he's arrested for Quincy Maxwell's murder. Then Mitch asks, you know, asks for her help with that. And she says that she will help him. And he also, you know, begs her not to tell Hannah because she would freak out about it. After Catherine hangs up the phone, Hannah tries to leave to look for Benny. You know, she tries, you know, she tries to lie to Hannah and she, you know, tries to stop Hannah, but she eventually tells Hannah that Benny is at the police station arrested for Quincy Maxwell's murder. Hannah then takes her phone from Catherine and runs out of the door while Catherine says, She's calling someone to help me. What a mess, y'all. What a mess. The next group of people we go to is Wyatt, Anna, Jim, and Oscar. Wyatt finally wakes up to find that, that Anna is by his bedside. She asks, how is he doing? And he says that he's fine. And then he realizes that he was asleep for a long time. And Anna confirms that. He says that he wants to go home soon. And Anna says that the doctor will discharge him as soon as he's able, you know, as soon as he's up and walking around and on his feet. And she also tells him that, that uh, she is happy with his progress. She says that she's going to get she says she's going on to get the car and that his clothes are on the seat and that he is doing very well in his recovery. After she leaves, Jim enters the room, you know, acting concerned that he's, you know, acting like he's concerned about Wyatt's well-being when we all pretty much know that all he cares about is himself. I mean, he's made that pretty clear. Wyatt, you know, doesn't want to be bothered with him. He says that he doesn't want to see or talk to him. 
Jim tries to reach out to him, but Wyatt physically backs away. He doesn't want to be anywhere near Jim. You know, Jim thinks he's afraid of him, but uh, Wyatt says, you know, you put me in jail, you know, with some lunatic, and you beat me up, and you treated him, you know, terribly. Wyatt thinks he is there to try to control him. Wyatt says that he has the money and he's not going to ever give it up and he doesn't want to be bothered with him or Catherine again. Jim then begs for the money. He begs him pretty much for the money, saying that we can pay your bills and give him an allowance, as if Wyatt is like a 14-year-old boy. Wyatt is a, is a grown man now. He's a grown man. And I mean, the, the fact that he said the word allowance, he said the word allowance, and and he just sees him as some sick little boy. And and yes, he is sick, but he's he's a man now. He's a man, not some fourteen year old boy, some teenager that he needs to give some kind of a an allowance to. That's crazy. Wyatt says that he's going to testify against him and that he's keeping the money. And he, you know, wants Jim and Catherine out of his life for good. He says he's going to put him away and it's going to be for good. Jim harps on him having a drug abuse problem, which Wyatt does. But Wyatt says, I'm in rehab. I've checked myself into rehab. Wyatt says that he's, you know, he's trying to get help. Jim says that he's proud of him for, you know, he's proud of him for obviously uh, trying to get help and trying to get clean. But I think we can, you know, why, I mean, excuse me, Jim believes that why, you know, is, is not going to make it through this. Why it says that he, he doesn't want to be bothered by him, that he's sick of him and, and he just wants to be left alone and that it's all done. He tells Jim to leave him alone and never and he never wants to see with him again and he walks out of the room leaving Jim standing there. After Wyatt leaves, Jim calls Oscar demanding him demanding of him that he gets the money back from Wyatt. He whines on about him having a drug problem and that he's and that uh, he needs to get that money back. Oscar says that he's working on it. He's working on it. And then he hangs up the phone. Just then, Anna walks up, you know, telling her that he has an offer for her. Now, let, let me talk about this. I know that Wyatt has a drug problem. I mean, there's no denying that. But... I really believe that Jim is a great hindrance to him. Why? I mean, let Wyatt be a man. He's trying to grow up. He's trying to fix himself. And Jim is steady sabotaging him. He needs to, you know, leave Wyatt alone. He needs to let him grow up. Let him be a man. Let him make mistakes. And let him learn from the mistakes. So he'll never do it again. He treats him like some idiot child. And he's a grown man now. He's, I mean, when he said the word allowance, when he said that, it just really, really occurred to me that Jim is really his problem. He really needs to get away from Jim and Wyatt, you know, if it would, I mean, if I was Wyatt, I would just leave town because he is really, really a hindrance to him. He has caused Wyatt pain all his life and, and if I'm honest, I think he wants Wyatt to remain a junkie just so he can have control over him. I think it's that far. He can't bear that he that Wyatt now has the upper hand. He can't bear that. His ego can't bear that. And I just think it's really, really sad. The next two people we go to is Veronica and Benny. At the Savannah police station, Veronica comes into the interrogation room to see Benny about the arrest. Benny says he doesn't know what's going on here. Veronica think it, it thinks it has something to do with Quincy, but Benny says that the Secret Service was here. 
and that they were questioning and threatening him. Veronica says that it, nothing about the Secret Service is in this report and that it should be. Benny says that they were just here and they said that they can that he could leave if he wanted to. Then they came back in here and expected, you know, some D, expected him to give up his DNA and accused him of being a terrorist. Veronica thinks that this is odd and she will look into it. Veronica says that they have charges on him. They that they do have charges pending against him and do have charges on him. And she thinks that this makes no sense. Veronica has been waiting on a response to the charges, but no response has come. Benny wants to just leave. Veronica says, you, yeah, Veronica says, who could be doing this to you? She doesn't know what's going on any more than Benny does. Then Benny starts to think that it was her, that this is her doing that she set this all into motion, but Veronica assures him that this is not on her. Veronica asks, what, what high power person did you piss off? Veronica, um, excuse me, Benny says, no one, I haven't pissed off any high power person but you. Then Benny accuses David, but Veronica tells him that David can't reach this high. You know, this is all that old snake Charles is doing. This is all Charles. I think he's trying to hold, I think he's trying to hold Candace's brother hostage as some kind of punishment or some kind of leverage. Benny, uh, Benny, excuse me, Veronica says that he will get him, that she will get him out as soon as she can. Benny says, okay, but he wants to talk to his mother. But Veronica won't give her, give, excuse me, won't give him her cell phone. She is working on getting him out, and she also expects him to sleep with her to work off the retainer fee. Now, let me talk one more time about Veronica before I give her up. She just said that she expects Benny to sleep with her. But in the preview, she's fighting with Erica over David. What, what does she want? You want to keep Benny and David too? What is that? Wh who does she want? Which man does she want? It's ridiculous. She's mad at David for moving on after she cheated on him. And she's still trying to get with the man that she cheated on, cheated on him with. But yet, she wants to hoop and holler and th make a scene all over David. What does she want? It's ridiculous. She is ridiculous. I don't even think she knows what she wants anymore. She's just so confused and crazy. The next group of people we go to is Anna, Jeffrey, and Justin. At the Artesian Hotel, Jeffrey gets a call from Anna saying that Wyatt is going home. Jeffrey is pleased and he smiles. It's probably the first time we've seen him smile in a long time. Justin then knocks on the door telling Jeffrey that Veronica threatened him. She says that she will go to his wife if he doesn't leave Jeffrey alone. He wonders and asks if he asks Jeffrey and wonders would she really do it? And Jeffrey says yes, she would do it. Jeffrey then warns, yeah, Jeffrey then warns Justin never to follow him again. And Justin says that he's sorry, but he had no other way to get in contact with him. Justin thinks Jeffrey doesn't want to see him anymore, and Jeffrey says it's not true. He just want you know he just wants some space he just wants some time off he just wants some time to relax and chill he admits that he was wrong for attacking him and justin asks jeffrey is he doing better now and jeffrey says only time will tell 
Justin says that he opened up his heart to him and that he doesn't even care. Jeffrey says, yeah, Jeffrey says, I do care about you. And he does care about him. But he just doesn't want him, you know, to turn everything around back on him. He wants him to own up to his mistake and, and really mean it. Justin just wants a pass for what he did. But Jeffrey says that you hurt me and that you beat me and that you almost got me killed. Then he apologizes again. Jeffrey, you know, just wants him to get on out of there. He just wants him to leave and just leave him alone. And then Justin says, is it because of Wyatt? Is Wyatt coming over here? And, and then <clears throat> Jeffrey asks him again just to leave. Justin tries to kiss him, but Jeffrey, you know, pushes him away and tells him to leave, and he does. Yeah, uh, Justin is really getting obsessed. You can really tell how obsessed he is. He's really, yeah, he, he, is, he is hooked. He is hooked on Jeffrey now. And I hope that... Um, I hope that things go well for them, but, you know, I have to wonder, I, I really have to wonder, you know, what's going to, what's going to happen in regards to Jeffrey and Justin, and now, you know, what's Wyatt's role, what will Wyatt's, Wyatt's role be in this now that he's better? Now, the last scene we have is of David, Erica, and Veronica. Veronica is really all over this episode in this one. She's really all over this. I mean, she's in full effect. David and Erica are having coffee at the Artesian Hotel. David thinks that she, that she didn't want to see him again, but she says that is not true. That she really did enjoy being with him. She enjoyed, you know, she enjoyed the sex, but she just wanted, you know, to slow things down. Which we all know is a lie. I mean, we remember what happened last season with the uh, warlock, you know, hiding in the closet. I mean, I, I mean, it's a shame that she's conning him because I really think they could be a good couple for each other. It's a shame that, you know, what's happening. It's, it's really a shame because I really do think they could be a good couple. I really like how they look together. They have great chemistry. But it's a shame that she's just conning him for the money. He says, I mean, she says that she really wants to be with him and that, you know, but well, the one thing that she doesn't really like is the fact that this crazy ex-wife is hanging around. He apologizes to her for that. And she says, and the thing with the flowers, I mean, you know, she, she really can tell that Veronica is crazy. And then Erica says, what more can she be capable of? And just then... The snake slithers up and sits down next to, next to them in between the two of them. And she says, you have no idea. And that's where the story ends. Thank you for watching my video. It has some really great confrontations in this episode. And I really, you know, enjoyed the episode, even though they could have moved the story a little bit more and they could have cut out, you know, some of the filler scenes and they could have been a little bit less repetitive as well. The next episode will be entitled Elevator 7 and I will be back to do my review for that, for that episode. My MVP of the night is Wyatt. I make made him my MVP because I'm glad that he can finally see through Jim's crap. You know, I'm glad that he's finally stepped up his game and that he's finally growing a backbone and that he stood up to his father and he's not going to let his father control his life anymore. You know, I'm glad for him for standing up, you know, for himself and standing up for his own life. And I'm glad that he is in rehab as well, that he, you know, consciously made the effort to call, you know, for help, to admit that he had a problem with drugs, and that he's actively seeking help, and he's trying to heal himself. So, 
for that. And Wyatt is my MVP of the episode, and he will be in my thumbnail. Thank you very much for watching my video. Make sure you like, comment, share, and subscribe if you like my video. And I will be back next week for the next episode. Watch out for my channel because there will be new videos popping up all the time. Thank you so very much. Enjoy your life as I do and have a wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you so much.